Welcome to this video, which is part of the 2021 edition of the Lund Contemporary Festival. And I also say welcome to Michael Edgerton. Thank you. Your composer and professor of artistic research at That's the right. Malmö Academy of Music. Uh, so very warm welcome. Thank you. So uh, we will talk about your research and your uh, artistic work. And later also we will be joined by your doctoral student, mm. Felicita Brusoni, uh, to talk about her research and also to discuss your piece, Anaphora, uh, which Felicita eventually will also perform a parts, parts of that uh, piece yep. here. Uh, but let's, let's start a little bit more generally about your, your artwork and your research. Uh, I know you are. You have been influenced by a big variety of uh, of styles and genres, and mm -hmm. also you have composed for a large number of different instrument combinations. Uh, but one thing uh, that often comes up in the in as an inspirational source um, is uh, different kinds of scientific processes mm -hmm. and uh, scientific uh, models. Could could you tell tell us a little bit about the, I mean the role that natural sciences have played in in your uh, and maybe still play in in your artistic work? Well, I think it's um, stemming from the time when I was a student, um, going through kind of typical academic types of. Um, procedures stemming from tonal harmonies, uh, theory classes where we learn how to compose according to the style of Bach, the style of Mozart, Beethoven, etc. Um, as we moved into the 20th century, how are we dealing with these different sorts of complexities of sound and complexities of, of uh, structure? And so I, I began looking at uh, for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, mechanical types of issues, um, such as why does glass break at certain angles when uh, a, a car passing by will, will um, shoot a, a stone up into the window and, and crack the, the windshield of, an of a car coming in the opposite direction. Um, looking at things of, of mechanics and how they work in the physical world and trying to transfer that, uh, those organizational principles and processes onto what we do as artists. Um, it's, it was a way to, to extend thinking beyond uh, harmonic language. So that was the beginning of this idea of, of, of looking uh, into other systems that might impact sound organization. Mm -hmm. And just, just broadly, I, I'm attempting to look at, at sound as a map. So if we think of a map of the world, I'm, I'm looking to go to those parts of the globe that are less inhabited than mm -hmm. others. So instead of going to China, I might go to, I don't know, some country in the Sahara where there's very few people. So I'm, I'm looking to explore sound and its organization uh, in ways that are not just reactionary, but but certainly not following the mainstream. Uh, my most recent piece was uh, part of a collaboration with uh, a researcher at ESS, mm -hmm. the European Spallation Source, and uh, there we were looking at um, at cryogenics. So when you uh, in the science fiction mm -hmm. movies, when people are deep frozen for a thousand <laughs> years and then they wake up, that's cryogenics, uh -huh. right? And so uh, cryogenics are used uh, at ESS in order that the neutron beam that's being sent down is a proton beam. Anyhow, that's being sent all those hundreds of meters before they're smashed into this this. Uh, this this wall, the cement wall, um, they need to be cooled, and if they're not cooled, then the whole place is going to explode. And so cryogenics is is a way to keep the place running, basically. But it's a fascinating world because there's all sorts of interesting phenomena when you get into ultra cold states. We're talking about states that go down to absolute zero, and and it's it's really fascinating to read about the types of uh, fluid behavior and the types of turbulence that exist along uh, absolutely uh, slick surfaces without any turbulence. So it's, it's 
fascinating. Yeah. So would it be correct to say that you you find a particular scientific phenomenon that interests you and then in a way like translates that process into a musical process sometimes yeah sometimes sometimes it's inspiration sometimes it's as simple as that mm. but usually i try to do something with the process mm -hmm. that makes sense otherwise why talk about it no no yeah, yeah. so you you in in that case it's more like you there is maybe a, a sound that you, you're searching for a, a sound and then you use the scientific processes as a way to achieve the sound or well it, it's it's more how can we uh, uh split the sound how can we break up the sound how can we uh turn the sound from a simple harmonic uh or let's say idiomatic way of producing sounds on an instrument like the clarinet and how can we then turn it into an extra complex sound in which we might have two fundamental frequencies not just one so two pitches, not just one pitch. Or we have the spectrum in, in which we have um, elements that are heightened so that we have the illusion of more than one fundamental frequency or, or changing the color in certain interesting ways. Um, these are the types of things that I'm exploring with a multi-dimensional type of world. Mm. And um, so it's, 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 it's sometimes really involved with the process of making sound, breaking it up, really focusing on sound production with, with humans. Mm. Yeah, I, th I think a, a good example of this is um, uh, the, which we will talk more about later, uh, mm -hmm. your work on, uh, on the human voice and uh, yeah. your research on, uh, on, uh, on yeah, how to extend the, the possibilities of the human voice uh, in ways that are usually not, or not so commonly used in our uh, vocal performances. Yeah. Uh, and for example, you have, you have uh, uh, written this uh, book, uh, The 21st Century Voice, which we have here, yeah, uh, <laughs> where you go through uh, this research. And uh, yeah. so could, could you tell us uh, something about this book and the research behind it? Yeah, it's um, uh, the idea is that we're looking to explore the limits of voice. Uh, limits in terms of sound production, limits in terms of perception of voice. And uh, the approach was um, that um, there are of course a million different ways you can structure a book, but I thought the way that would be the most beneficial to musicians and composers would be to um, give them specific tools that we could use in a pragmatic way. So this is based on voice science, the, the way that people understand that we have a power element that drives the sound. We have something that breaks up the air, which are the vocal folds. We have something that resonates uh, the sound once the sound is broken up or once the air is broken up. We have a resonator, which is the space from the vocal folds to the lips and then and also to the nose and then we have a way of, of moving that sound around uh, uh, called articulation which we do on all instruments as well and uh, this book uh, uses that basic framework and with a few other additions in order to give uh, people very practical and pragmatic things that they can do in order to explore the instrument because the idea with this book is not a historical document yeah. this is what's been done yeah. but it's rather what can be done and it's based on experiments with voice now and presenting different ways that people can go forward with the instrument as as creative people yeah yeah okay but Shall we maybe zoom in on a few mm. of uh, few specific pieces that you yeah. have composed? Yeah. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, this piece for solo bass clarinet. Thanks. Um, called Benar Instability, mm. um, and we were talking about getting inspiration from from um, from scientific phenomena. Yeah. And uh, here. Uh, yeah, Benar instability is, as I have understood here, the, it is a, a, a physical phenomenon that uh, has inspired you to yeah. this piece. So uh, the, uh, the basic principle is that if, if you have a small box and you heat the bottom with a, with uniformly with a coil or, or something of that nature, the heat begins to rise. 
and the liquid inside will begin to revolve around. Um, as the heat begins to rise, the cool liquid is then pushed down and we begin to have an activity of movement within the box. Uh, what will happen as the heat continues to rise is that you begin to have irregularities in these patterns so that, so that you have areas of stasis, of stability, and then you have areas of of really wild instabilities. And so this piece is trying to model that idea that you have you have this motion, this movement mm -hmm. that's happening, that's 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 being generated by a uniform source that provides islands of stability uh, or islands of irregularity, instability. So it's it's always changing. So it's it's not uh, I hope <laughs> giving the perception of being one thing, but that we have a changing types of changing types of phenomena between stability and stability, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's uh, it's a challenge with a solo instrument because you have one thing. So is are these islands going to occur one after the other? Is it going to be purely a metaphorical thing? For me, that would be pretty lacking, right? Mm -hmm. That would be that wouldn't be so effective. So what I tried to do is I tried to overlap sounds simultaneously, so that the bass clarinetist would be making a a, a noise sound at the lips while producing a sound from the vocal tract. It could be from uh, the vocal folds or could be some other location while producing a sound on the bass clarinet while moving the reed off center so that you have sounds escaping from two different locations or three. And, and so it's that idea that we have an over overlapping of simultaneous sounds so that we can have regions of instability or stability. At the same time. At the same yeah, time, yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really the 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 uh, 3D image of the box. Mm. Yeah. Complicated for the musician to uh, play, an, oh. almost play an ensemble with himself or yeah, yeah, herself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So this recording was made by Theo Nabischt uh, from Germany, and uh, you, you were there, Felicita, for for this, and um, and he wasn't happy with his performance by any means because he had worked on it for a couple of two or three months steadfastly, but he wasn't happy because he didn't go far enough and we didn't actually have a chance to sit in the same room ah. and, and work together. Because and it was so uh, still, the, or it was during this pandemic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and life became very complicated yeah, yeah, last yeah. year. Yeah. Which is also the reason we sit uh, a <laughs> bit from each other here. <laughs> yeah, okay, so but maybe... Uh, Shall I play? Yeah, show, show, show us the example. Okay. For, it, it is from this, uh, this recording in Germany. Uh, yes, he, he premiered the piece in Germany um, at the, uh, at the um, what do we call that again? Uh, uh, it was at that cabaret uh, near the Stadtmitte. Um, and anyhow, um, yeah. uh, he premiered this in Berlin, but this was from the performance in Malmö. Okay, this is from Malmö. Yeah. yeah.
Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, we really heard these all these multiple layers of different mm. types of mm. uh, sound production that you talked about. Um, yeah, I wanted to give a I wanted to give an example here of a lot of activity. So there are other sections that actually have more layering. Mm -hmm. When he's doing, uh, particularly the circular breathing. Okay. Yeah, yeah he yeah. has a very long sections in which he's circular breathing for over a minute at a time. And there you really hear the layers pile up as mm. it continues without breathing. <laughs> okay, cool. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, next uh, example we will talk about uh, we have uh, uh, this, uh, it's a piece for piano. Mm. Uh, where you use the piano in also in slightly unusual ways. Yeah. Um, and this piece has a rather long title. Uh, um, in, it's uh, it's called noise is interrupting my practice silence is when my reaction is quiet silence is my protest against the way things are yeah so it's 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 a title in three parts what could you tell us about this uh, this title <laughs> Well, in a way, this is also autobiographical, but I better not talk about that. Okay. Um, uh, so it, it did have to do with a life's event. event. Ah. And, um, and this is literally my reaction to something that was pretty destructive. And I decided to, to take the approach of silence okay. uh, in this case. Yeah. I mean, I've lived in some pretty, uh, you know, I've not been in the institution for most of my career. I've no. been outside of yeah. institutions yeah. for most of my career. So um, uh, being in um, unusual situations all around the world, you, you have to deal with things uh, on a very, uh, I mean, you have to deal with them from people to people, you mm -hmm. know, because when you're the constant foreigner, you, you, you have very little power to deal with things sometimes. And so you have to choose your battles. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. yeah, yeah. Uh, so this one uh, was, yes, autobiographical. And, and it actually comes from uh, a, a, a short story. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I should have thought to brought that to bring that story with me because it was quite uh, 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 very interesting. Um, but if we move then maybe to the the, the more musical yes. a aspect, the mm. pure musical aspect, we mm. um, in a program note for this piece uh, you have written that uh, it is a reflection of what otherwise remains in danger of not being heard. Yeah. What do you mean? So. Uh, Every sound that's being made in the mechanical world has all these little noises that normally we don't focus on. Like speech. Yeah, yeah. We, we have like the word speech, we have a sp, and then e, which is the vowel, and then we have the ch. So, uh, speech, speech. Normally we focus on the voiced elements, but in fact it's the consonants, it's those noises that define uh, the semantic content for us. So the way that we understand language is not the vowels, not the harmonic, not the pretty sounds, it's the ugly sounds that define what it is that we're saying. That's, 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 that's pretty amazing when you think about it. It's those ugly little sounds that we pay no attention to, that if they're gone, then we suddenly start missing the meaning. What? 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 I, I didn't quite get that. So interrupting. We have the int, er, r, r, so that's 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 where the tongue comes close to something but doesn't actually touch. Interrupt, p -t, p -t, ing, and and all of these little noises we normally we ignore them. We in ignore a way. them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we we perceive them. Or we 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 they they are they are important for us to understand. Yeah, uh, and the thing is, we don't ever think about them. No. But if they're missing, then we would certainly think about them. Yeah. We'd be like, what's wrong with that guy's speech? 
And then, uh, of course, this is also the case with, for example, playing when f yeah. playing a piano. Yeah. So yeah. whenever you hit a key on the piano, there's a noise that happens at the beginning. Actually, not more. Uh, I mean, there's many noises. Actually, there's mm. about three or four, depending on how closely the sound is mic'd. Like if you put a microphone right on the piano or even a contact mic, you can really hear the different levels of noise that uh, that happen. Um, now, of course, that would be really annoying if you're listening to Chopin. Right? <laughs> Who wants to listen to those noises? Right? That would be incredibly uh, annoying. So what I did was I, uh, in this piece, had like a thousand microphones all over the piano. I'm exaggerating. There's only about seven. Uh, but we had a problem with the performance in Malma, which I'm going to play. There's a lot of feedback, and so there's some strange things that will happen in the recording, and that's uh, the result of trying to get back, uh, trying to get rid of the feedback that that happened because the the recording setup was was not good it was it was just a fault of the time shall we listen to the recording so let's listen to it yeah but uh, what i wanted to say was that all those little small noises that happen in the piano are now brought to the forefront and all the pitch noises we're trying to reduce yeah, yeah. to the background you, you have zoomed in on what is happening in yeah, between yeah. each uh, normal yeah. Note, if, uh, if, if, if I may say. Yeah. 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 So here's a short excerpt, or two short excerpts. <laughs> Except one, except two. Yeah, I've I've I've, uh, I, I've watched a, a video of mm -hmm. this, and I know that the, the pianist is like shaking the the keys <laughs> and yeah. like slamming the the pedal up and down, and right. so yeah. So yeah. it's really a, an example of all these noises that that we uh, we don't really. I mean, when we when we do a, a regular uh, a performance of a regular uh, classical piano piece, yeah. we try to to uh, to mute these sounds as much exactly. as possible. Yeah. But here, you instead you lift them up as right. to the fore for right. forefront foreground. Yeah, and it also tied to that important that everything was from the keyboard, or or, or from the normal playing position. Nothing was inside oh. the piano. Everything was on the keyboard or with the pedals. So he wasn't knocking on the piano. Everything was on the keys. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next we have um, uh, a quartet for bass, clarinet, mm. uh, trumpet, trombone, and uh, voice. Yeah. Uh, inspired by, by inspired by the Mongolian steppe. Yeah. Yeah, and it's called uh, 
Return of the Taki. Is it correct pronunciation? Ta yeah, Taki. I, I guess yeah. I was Return yeah. of Taki. Um, the last feral horse. Yes. So Taki is a horse that was once uh, thought to be extinct in the wild, which was domesticated in a f on a few farms, which was then returned to the wild, and it became, again, a, f uh, a wild horse. So feral refers to something that was once wild, that was domesticated, that now becomes wild again. So, uh, and this was, uh, in the world of biology, kind of a big phenomenon because this horse was thought to be extinct. And, and now it's again uh, alive and living. And, and Taki is a short, squat horse, very powerful. And, and it's very interesting to see the relation of Taki uh, with, with other, uh, other sorts of horses because, uh, because they're so powerful, these horses. Uh, the breed and it's um, it, it, it's fascinating and, and it's a nice story. This piece, in a simple way, are the sounds of Mongolia, the animals that inhabit uh, the natural world. So you have uh, listened to these sounds and recorded these sounds and analyzed these sounds and then incorporated into oh I've analyzed the some of them. Or yeah, so for instance, uh, like singing sand, there's this phenomenon in which uh, sand, uh, when it's being blown uh, at certain, uh, uh, with certain pressure at certain uh, angles, can actually have the perception of singing. And, and it's, it's in such a way that sometimes people are really scared to go to some regions of the world, like they won't go there, some native societies, because they'll be so freaked out, like, no, don't go there at nighttime because that's when the spirits come and yeah. we'll get killed if we go there. So it's, it's, it's really interesting that these singing sands are uh, uh, also part of the great Gobi Desert uh, in Mongolia. Mm. So you, and then you have, um, you have analyzed it with the, with the help of uh, scientific uh, te te techniques in this uh, mm. case and then, uh, yeah. and then in a way Try, try to recreate the sound or? Um, not exactly recreate, but uh, influenced by uh. the nature of a singing sand or the nature of the reindeer or the nature of the wolf. I mean, yes, I, I used the wolf call in, in this piece. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, uh, but, but not sung in a typical way, like somebody mimicking a wolf. Uh, no. do that. Yeah. More... Uh, uh, hopefully more interesting, yeah. Uh, <laughs> more metaphorical or...? No, 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 no. It, it's that I have uh, the voices sent through instruments. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so you can hear the typical line of the wolf cry, mm. but it's through the instrument, which then adds a different resonating property, yeah, yeah, yeah. And et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the few pieces that I actually use text. And this is uh, ancient Mongolian text, not, not modern Mongolian, but ancient Mongolian from about a thousand years ago, uh, and uh, speaking uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Oh, <laughs> 
Yeah, so if, if, I, if I didn't know that these sounds were produced, you know, through uh, our traditional Western classical instruments, then I probably wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, cool. I, I think you can really hear, you know, I, I, I don't know that, uh, or if I didn't know that it was the Mongolian step, maybe I shouldn't think of exactly that, but you could definitely, you know, relate to some kind of na natural sounds. Cool, uh, great. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So I think it's time maybe to welcome Felicita on stage. Okay. Okay. So now I welcome Felicita Brusoni. Thank you very uh, much. Also to join us on stage. And you are a singer, a high soprano to be yes, more I specific. Am. And you're also a doctoral student uh, at the Malmö Academy of Music. Um, so we will soon talk about uh, Michael's composition Anaphora, uh, which you will also perform a part of. And uh, but uh, please first uh, let us know uh, a little bit about your own research project uh, as a doctoral student. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I can say that actually my um, project and my own research project and my life here it began uh, by chance, and. It is really linked to this uh, piece named Anaphora by Michael. Uh, because actually one year ago, it was the beginning of 2020, and just before uh, the pandemic and everything else, I was here to have some rehearsals and to study the piece with uh, the, the composer, so with Mike. And it was a sort of not really a rehearsal, but also something like going deeply inside the piece and the sounds inside the piece and the possibilities of voice in general. And that led me to the, um, to the possibility of uh, doing this doctoral project here, um, which is, um, as everybody knows, um, a forward university about um, the thing of having the artistic research pro project program in general. For example, in Italy and in south of Europe, we don't have this. So it's, for me, it's a great opportunity because it's not only a research, which is normally intended as scientific research, but also um, the possibility of doing research inside my job, which is of a singer, because my background is of an operatic singer, singer so I started uh, classical singing as for the beginning that my um, main subject was uh, vocal chamber music focused on uh, 20th century and 21st century music and then since 2012 I started to explore the possibilities of voice trying to go uh, over the boundaries the normal boundaries so contemporary music but also experimental music then so i landed in this particular piece anaphora and that gave me uh, the rehearsal that we have mike it really gave me the the main idea of my research project which is built around the extra normal voice which is every every um, use of the voice that is not considered as normal, like speech or like classical singing or like pop singing or this kind of stuff. But a voice that is used for 100% or 
trying to use for 100% of its actual possibilities. Um, so my intention is to build up a, a sort of method um, working with composers on one side, but also with other singers on the other side. So uh, all together to build up these new methods to handle new techniques, to yeah to improve these extra normal voice techniques. And my intention is also to build up an archive, uh, which could contain f both physically and in a um, um, digital way scores, but also audio files, video files, everything around these, uh, this thing of the extra normal voice. And mm, it would be yeah, like a, a cool uh, place on the internet w where you can have scores and you can click on some excerpts on the score and you can have exactly the audio file from that particular excerpt or video files or I mean tutorials to improve that particular techniques and things like that. Well, for, for me as, as a composer, that would uh, be extraordinary. I mean, it would be re really great to, uh, you know, to find, s to have such a place to, uh, like, yeah, like, yeah, as you say, an, an archive yeah. or uh, a place where you can, can actually study and, uh, and see. But I guess also for other singers to, uh, yes, exactly. to be able to... But are, are you thinking of, like, creating some kind of... Um, uh, like notation conventions or because of course that's always a problem when when working with with the new music and o almost never used before uh, techniques uh, that everybody invents their own uh, exactly. their own notational language in a way uh. yeah the thing is that for for voice and for solo voice pieces um for uh, for years, the main uh, masterpiece has been Sequenza 3 by Luciano Berio. So uh, the most part of the notation is taken from there. Uh, but of course, things are going forward in the meantime. So yeah, my uh, other purpose is to find new solutions for notation. Also, we were talking with Mike about um, building up a system in multiple le levels to in case of uh, sounds with of course multiple levels of, uh, of of little sounds inside so yeah we're trying to build this uh, with the composers help of course and also i read uh, on your um, on on your profile uh, at the lund university research portal uh, that you might also use the help of uh, other uh, experts from other disciplines, like maybe medical experts? And yeah, uh, for sure. A large part of the project is to um, study in a, the, a mo the most scientific way the, um, yeah, the, the voice. And we're, um, for the moment, we're collaborating with this human lab here in Lund and to trying to develop some techniques. We are trying to uh, discover some more things about this uh, M4, which is a, yeah, a glottal whistle. Yeah, we're um, beginning a project that will look at medical uh, aspects of the voice. So we're, we're working with medical professionals um, uh, beginning that process because it's quite a lengthy process to be to be able to work with people in hospitals and in clinics um, but this is a project I've been involved with for a long time uh, over 10 years and uh, we're uh, going to begin this phase of the project uh, and um, um, and that's well on its way <laughs> Yeah, that's why I will ask for the help for, from the linguistics area, mm. the, the phonetics and all this stuff. And also as regarding the applications of this extra normal voice, I was wondering um, some kind of applications in the video games world, because mm. I've noticed that we have the 
massive that is the um, Ubisoft um, yeah, in Malmö. Main, yeah, yeah, exactly. Just in front of the Inter Arts Center. Mm. So maybe, yeah, we can do something together because they're using a lot of this kind of sounds. Okay. So uh, this piece, Anaphora, uh, how, how is this linked to your uh, project or your research? Yes. You want to introduce the, the, the other piece? Or? Well, uh, maybe just briefly. Uh, yeah. This is a piece for um, 56 classes of multiphonics. Uh, loosely grouped around the ideas of voiced and voiced multiphonic, voiced and unvoiced multiphonic, unvoiced and unvoiced multiphonic. So th three uh, main groups. Three main categories, but yeah. sometimes they're a little bit in flux um, because uh, the voicing can change uh, very rapidly and very quickly because you can have a pitch sound without voice. For instance, could and maybe could any one of you <laughs> make any examples, maybe of these? Uh, I mean, a, a voiced and voiced multiphonic and a, a voiced and unvoiced. Yeah, for uh, sure. Uh, I will start with the voiced and voiced multiphonic, um, which is uh, the combination of uh, normal vocal pitch and the vocal fry which is basically uh, uh, the, yes, of course. So normal pitch is uh, vocal fry. Uh, and I can add the two together, which means that they're both made with uh, vocal folds. So we have a voiced voiced coming from the same source, which are vocal folds. Uh, so I will start with the pitch and then add the vocal fry. Uh, and the funny thing is that the resulting is one octave above the pitch that I took with a normal pitch sung. So this is one of the 56 multiphonics. Yeah, then <coughs> we can have some examples from the second category, the voiced and unvoiced sounds. Um, uh, let's take, for example, it's not from this piece, but it's from a piece by Vinko Globokar. And the name of the piece is Jenseits der Sicherheit, which means <laughs> Again, <laughs> over the, uh, the comfort zone, <laughs> we can see the security <laughs> zone. <laughs> so again, going beyond the boundaries. And it is a uh, normal glottal pitch uh, plus an, a whistle. So the, again, uh, and then <laughs> all together. And this piece in this excerpt involves also um, the voice coming outward and also inward. So it's, is, it is a mix of the two things. faster and faster. Um, now, uh, just to take the last category, which is unvoiced and unvoiced sounds. Mm, for example, I can try to match the palatal frication, which is <coughs> with an aggressive nasal frication. <laughs> And this is pretty challenging. Yeah. And that's what I love from the piece Anaphora. Mm. The tease. That you don't have these techniques like studied and taken and put there. But the aim of the piece is to um, continuously searching for um, the sound. There should be a struggle at every, 
every moment of the piece. Every there's moment. a struggle. Yeah, like like producing those two sounds <laughs> together is really difficult, and you have to have really fight for it. <laughs> When I listen to sound files of this piece at your website, mm. I, it struck me that actually this, uh, this enormous exercise, it, 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 it gets through to the listener because I, I, um, I realized I was there myself, like <laughs> sitting and, and you know, <laughs> trying to be, uh, be, be yeah, with, exactly. with the singer in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not, not that I did the same thing, but I was like, you know, yeah, yeah. really, really tense from from the, yeah. the this, uh, yeah, That's beautiful. struggle nice. from the from, from the singer. Uh, yeah, and uh, for me, it's also important that it has to do with um, really have small changes inside what you are doing in that precise moment yeah. and this little 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 changes we, we're talking about i don't know uh, less than one millimeter mm. in every muscle you move inside and and you know uh, we're talking about things that you can see so really small changes that can uh, lead you to uh, other ways mm. one way two ways mm. together mm. three mm. ways together yeah. And every time you don't know which way will mm -hmm. be in yeah. the end. And that's for me as a performer is so, so amazing because you're there and you're, you're really, n you don't know wh where you're going to. So that's you know, really fascinating. Yeah. I, I have um, uh, one question for, uh, for, um, for Michael actually, mm -hmm. um, uh, because when, uh, since this piece, it's in a way both um, a musical composition, but also in a way a catalog of mm. of, of sounds yeah. um, or of sound producing techniques. Mm. Maybe mm. Um, was there? I mean, in the compositional process, uh, did this mean any any difficulties? Like, as uh, I mean. Uh, an internal antagonism yeah. between between absolutely. these two aspects, yeah. if you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, it's really pretty radically different than normal compositional activities because I had to be true to the notion of of multiphonic one, multiphonic two, multiphonic three. I mean, I didn't work in that way, but you have all these different sets. And, uh, and within each category of multiphonic, we have this aspect of these micro changes, which I call scaling, mm -hmm. right? You make very small changes using the same parameters, same methods, and you begin to get different results, which is something that Yacht Blanc does uh, quite well as an improviser. So um, this then really messes with the idea of repetition, for instance, which is something that we use. We use materials and then we re reuse them in different ways, in different contexts, um, sometimes very slight, sometimes very literal repetition. And this piece is based on a different idea. So how do I then achieve the notion of repetition while adding different multiphonics? There are some of the techniques are repeated from time to time, and so I do build in uh, this kind of literal repetition. But sometimes I have to, uh, through two or three different multiphonics, I have to link them by s taking one element that stretches from multiphonic three to multiphonic twenty to multiphonic thirty-nine. By, by using some sort of similar procedure, which could be air, which could be ingress of phonation, which could be something with the nose. I mean, it could be with the palate moving up and down. There's a lot of different ways to, to work with those ideas. But it's how do you make a line through different procedures. It's like taking a fishing line or you, you, you tie, and tie it to a needle and you put it through one type of material, then through another type, then through another type, and then through the glass. Like yeah, it, you're right. It's it's a extreme struggle. difficulties yeah. in that way. And then this, I guess, is the the meaning of the title, right? Yeah. Because anaphora is a word from uh, ancient Greek, which means carrying on, 
Yeah, repetition, yeah, repetition at the yeah, it's beginning the same of thing. a phrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have an example at the beginning of the score of uh, from uh, Shakespeare using an uh, anaphora in Shakespeare or a anaphora in Shakespeare. Uh, uh, like, anaphora. like a quotation <laughs> in. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is it there? Is it at the beginning yeah. of the score? You have that? Yeah, actually, it's here. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, you can show it to, from to one the of second. the cameras, maybe. <laughs> So here is the, in the middle of it. Uh, this royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, the seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection in the hand of war. This happy breed of man, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a... Anaphora. Okay, yeah, so, Anaphora. so yeah, and, and th this repetition is something that occurs in a way yeah. in, in yeah, 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 but uh, in different uh, yeah, n forms, not as, as stones of one element, but one element of the multiphonic being the, the anaphora. Yeah, 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 so it's not both parts or three parts if it's three part, but it's just one of the elements that's then. Stitch through. Okay. So we will uh, finish by hearing Felicita Brusone perform Anaphora by Michael Edgerton uh, here at Skisonas Museum in Lund as part of the 2021 edition of the Lund Contemporary Festival. So very big thanks to both of you for participating here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
This was the first excerpt from Anaphora. <laughs> 